Hi, everybody. My name is John DePietro. And I'm Bob Zagami with the Camper Report Show. On this Camper Report Show, Bob, I take you in, around, and on top of the brand new Winnebago Solus Class B motorhome, but not just anyone. It's the National Park Foundation model. It is really cool. It was cool. an, it's a great interview and a timely one with Bobby Cornwell, who is the president and CEO of the Florida RV Park and Campground Association. And we're going to talk a little bit about the tragedy and the <clears throat> lost campgrounds, but also we're going to be optimistic and talk about uh, still coming to Florida because 98% of the parks are open. Right, exactly. And uh, I think we're going to get into a real longer discussion a real longer there's a new term for you a little bit more in-depth discussion about that in our new segment coming right up whereabouts bob on the camper report show stay with us everybody hey everybody welcome back to the camper report show my name is john DePietro. it's a new segment and we're going to do things a little bit differently and we are going to really talk about what hurricane ian did to the rv and campground community both in Florida and in Myrtle Beach. And Bob, you had an extensive conversation with an official from the uh, Florida Campground Association. Give us the headlines of what he talked yeah. about with you. <laughs> yeah, my interview is with Bobby Conwell, the president and CEO of Florida RV Park and Campground Association. And I saw an article that he wrote this week uh, in RV Business, our friends who normally give us our news along with Woodall's Campground Magazine. And he he wanted to get the message out about Florida being open. Yes, it was devastating and, and it was tragic, uh, especially the campgrounds that were hit. But he also wanted people to know that 98% of the campgrounds in Florida are open. But in that affected area, there are some that may not uh, be able to rebuild because mm -hmm. the damage was extensive. Now, by... Uh, by that area, what are you referring to, Bob? What uh... Fort, Fort Myers Beach uh, area, Fort Myers Beach, and and parts of Fort Myers, and and a little bit of the counties that go around that. That was really a a, a direct hit. Uh, there was one campground there that uh, probably is not going to be able to open. That had seventeen employees, but fifteen of them lived in the campground, so they lost the campground. They lost their homes. They lost their income. Uh, they lost everything they own. Uh, yep. It's yep. what we saw up and down the coast. It yep. wasn't just Fort Myers. Yep. Now, it should be pointed out that what the national media likes to do, especially the Weather Channel, is find the absolute worst opportunity and talk about that. So it very well could be the fact that in some cases – two miles down the road from where the extensive damage was, there's hardly any damage at all. And that's very important to understand because RVers and campers, they bring a lot of economic incentive. And uh, let's face it, they're good for the economy, right, Bob? Yeah, and <clears throat> to your point about the media, they, they try to report it, but they tend to sway it on the negative side. Mm -hmm. And there are hundreds of thousands of people that travel south to Myrtle Beach, to the Carolinas, to Florida, they're snowbirds. They come down for up to uh, usually maybe a four-month stint or a six-month yep. stint. They do spend a lot of money, but stories like that tend to scare people away. Mm -hmm. So somebody that had a reservation would look at just that particular spot, just that Fort Myers and Naples and <clears throat> the surrounding area, Fort Myers Beach especially, and say, that's it, we're not going to go to Florida. So Bobby wants to get that message out. And I think it's a, I think it's the right message. We, yep. we paid tribute to the uh, brave people, the first responders, and yes, it was a tragedy, and it's going to take a long time to rebuild. I don't, I don't think that came through in a lot of the reports. No, no, I mean, Santa, no. Santa all it shows is... <clears throat> Sanibel Island may not even be able to recover. Yeah, they want to show. Island, we, you're talking a, probably a decade, five years or a decade. And we have family members that have a property there and it was built with concrete and it, and it withstood the direct hit. 
However, you can't get to it. However, the pool is devastated. However, all of the amenities that were on the grounds of this condo development are not available. However, the restaurants aren't there. However, the people that do the work, you know, the um, landscaping people, the uh, condo association managers, they live off campus. So <laughs> right now with Sanibel, you can't get to it unless you've got your own plane or your own boat. So, you know, those are the devastated areas. But it's important to point out that really those are the exceptions. I mean, we have friends that live in the Tampa area. Um, no problem at all. Tampa was supposed to be the um, the epicenter uh, to begin with when the weather people started reporting it. Um, you have a property in Naples, which is what? More, more, more than 40 miles from... Yeah, only Myers. 30 30 miles from downtown. We had no damage. We no were damage. We were outside. We were outside the outside ring, and we just had rain yep. and wind. And I think one tree came down in the entire Ave Maria complex. Uh, right. Yeah, it was different. Well, yep. you know, one of the things that didn't get covered enough, I thought, by the media, which is understandable, they they have a slant, and you know, they they allow even they even allow politics to play into it, but the the pre-staging of assets before this hurricane was absolutely amazing. They were, as soon as the rain stopped, those trucks were on the road. There were actually places in Fort Myers Beach, uh, yeah, Fort Myers Beach, that actually have their electricity back on. Which they don't have crazy. any houses, they yeah. don't have any buildings, but to oh. go back and do repairs or run run equipment, they they have it on. And it, they said it's going to be a record for the for the, all of these people to get their electricity and their utilities back on, but that's because they had staged so many vehicles and so many crews. Do you know that they, they had crews from thirty seven of the fifty states before the hurricane hit, and additional additional ones uh, are going now down. Both the national some states are sending national guard, and and they are on top of it. Yeah. yeah. So the other thing that we need to talk about, in addition to Florida, when it comes to RVing, and we vacation there this summer, is Myrtle Beach. I mean, this hurricane was amazing because it came in the west coast of Florida, went across the coast of Florida, took uh, I-95, well, a little bit to the east of I-95, and then came back in Charleston, Myrtle Beach area. And yep. um, a couple of the big places that actually that we've stayed at both of these places, Ocean Lakes and... Um, Myrtle Beach Travel Park um, were hit by it. I'm sure Pirate Land and and the others that are in there. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure Lakewood. Yeah. Lakewood is right next to yeah, right. They're ocean, all Ocean Lakes, and and each of those each has Ocean Lakes and uh, Lakewood have about three thousand sites, and then they're, they're right next to each other. The, right, they're the here. Water up the sand they're came here. up, but then again, I I saw a picture from uh, Myrtle Beach Travel Park today and and they did an amazing job cleaning up the debris on that and ocean states is you know they're telling people they're open for business they're taking new reservations they're accepting the ones that they already had and and this is another thing because when when you do talk about florida a lot of people come down from the northeast well they don't go down in one day so some of them many of them will stop at ocean lakes or lakewood or the, or the parks in myrtle beach on their way down to Florida and also spend a lot of their money and their resources while they're there. Yep. So, you know what, it's important that um, you check with the individual park first, because what we're talking about right now, as we tape this may be different um, next week when it airs or Friday when it airs. So right. consequently, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, there are people that um, have made their reservations at parks that, have been severely damaged those are the people if their motorhome is up their motorhome slash travel trailer whatever is up north um and you still want to go to florida then you've got to check around and see what is available um you know for seasonal sites because seasonal sites in florida are taken months in advance if not years in advance anyway yeah. so there may be those people that don't want to go down for whatever reason so their site would become available and uh, those that want to go down because of one thing or another, because they don't like winter, like, like you, yeah. um, you know, 
there there's probably still a way to handle them wouldn't you well, say we, we did we did talk about that and they you know that many people talk about going down in prior years and they couldn't get reservations because some of them are sold out a year in advance well the, realistically there are going to be a lot of cancellations so the market is better for rvs who have never been to florida this year than it probably has been in 10 years now you have to check the Florida State Directory, call the individual campgrounds, but you're going to find that there's a lot of availability uh, in there this year that we didn't see in even in the COVID years. Yeah. Yep. If you go to rvlife.com, that has so many of the associations and the individual campgrounds, Right. Um, the RV Life travel app, that you can find out all of the um, contact information for the park that you want to go to and, and, and use use our yeah. wizard to plan your trip to florida yep exactly so with that being said um there's always a way to find something positive of a negative situation and you know what maybe you want to go down there not thinking that you're going to sit down for four months but maybe you want to go down and and provide some help to the people that are less fortunate so that's always a good thing as well so we want to tell you that um there's always hope right bob right Right. And we hope, speaking of hope, we hope you will stay with us for we've got two great episodes. And um, this is what, Bob? The Camper Report Show. Stay with us, everybody. Okay, welcome back, everybody, to the Camper Report Show. And my guest today is very topical, um, Bobby Cornwell, uh, president and president and CEO of the Florida RV Park and Campground Association. And Bobby, thank you very much for squeezing in the interview, giving what we've all seen happen in Fort Myers Beach and Naples. Um, talk to that briefly in terms of the impact on your campgrounds down there. Sure. Thanks uh, for having me, Bob. Yeah, and I wish it was under different circumstances, of course. Uh, so yeah, as everybody knows, it's been uh, pretty tragic uh, down in Fort Myers, especially the Fort Myers Beach area, uh, Sanibel in that area. Uh, we lost um, anywhere from probably five to 15 parks. Um, not sure how long term, uh, but, but there are probably at least three or four that were, were totally wiped away. Uh, by use of a term, but um, they, they were damaged badly um, beyond repair in many cases. Uh, but hopefully uh, they will be be brought back to life eventually, but it's going to take a year or two for sure. Um, overall, that area of the state has, gosh, roughly 60 RV parks between Lee, Collier, and Charlotte County, the whole Fort Myers area there. Um, we have more RV parks there than any place in the, in the state of Florida and probably in the nation um, that short um, distance. Uh, from each other. So even though we had a lot destroyed, uh, there are many more there that are able to pick up a lot of the traffic and the displaced RV here. So that's a good thing. And we're already hearing reports that many parks within the Fort Myers area, not on the beach side, uh, but inland, are already back up and running and they have power. So uh, it's going to be a slow process for many. Um, but yet, like I said, uh, the industry as a whole down there is, is going to be operational. It's just the, the few parks that were really destroyed. It's going to be um, you know, a long but time. I, I, I thought it was amazing how they had pre, uh, pre-set up all the uh, electrical companies. I, I saw one report that there was electrical companies from 37 of the 50 states that were all lined up, ready to go if, if the worst case situation ha- uh, happened. Uh, and it did. And uh, so, yeah, it, some of them are getting back really, really quick in terms of uh, right. getting, to, getting started on the reconstruction and the uh, repair and cleanup that they have down there. You know, I, I saw the article that you had done with uh, RE Business this week, and it, it intrigued me because of one of the quotes that you had that, you know, when these things typically happen, whether it's Florida or Louisiana or Texas, 
people tend to look at them and and immediately start to cancel reservations or without getting the full picture of what happened. And, and you alluded to it in terms of the mileage between uh, Pensacola and, and Key West. This is is this horrible tragedy. It's there, but there's the rest of Florida, and you coming in. Florida's coming into now, probably the peak camping season with the snowbirds and what have you. So speak to that and why it's important. The message that you want people to hear about why they should not be canceling their reservations unless it's in an impacted park. Right, right, exactly. So yeah, uh, Florida is obviously a very big state. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's probably 900 miles from, from tip to tip, Pensacola to Key West. Um, but, you know, just taking the, the Fort Myers area alone that was so heavily damaged, you, know, you have a, 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 you know, the impact zone there, which is really bad. But just 20 miles out, you, you know, you will have a, many RV parks that are operational and have power. So, um, you know, we, we lost some sites, uh, but there are plenty left, not only in that area, but of course, throughout the state. So yeah, I've heard from many um, campground owners and operators, not only in Fort Myers, but surrounding areas and as far north as the Panhandle up in the Panama City or Tallahassee or Pensacola, Jacksonville, et cetera, that are you know, receiving calls from snowbirds that were coming down, and instead of going all the way south, they're going to just, you know, head north, get into the state, and camp farther north than anticipate it. So, um, and we're hearing that from park owners throughout the state. Uh, so, I hope that everybody's still going to continue to come down. We're encouraging that, and we're trying to get that word out too, of course, because, you know, the state is definitely open. Um, 95% of our campgrounds, shoot, probably more than that, about 98% of our campgrounds are unaffected. So you know, the vast majority are, are are fine and open and operational. We have uh, about 750 parks in Florida, um, 400 that are part of our association, and you know roughly probably about 15 that are that are closed right now. So um, you know the vast majority are open, and uh, we will continue to uh, supply the sites for all the RVers that come down for sure. But well, our our hearts and prayers go out for those that are closed. So yeah, I want to undermine that. And, and ironically, they're coming off two COVID years, which impacted their revenue and their business and people not not being able to travel. So it's 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 critical that those who can travel do travel. That, that's true. Um, Florida was fortunate during those years as well, though, because once again, our state was pretty much open during that time, um, as opposed to many other states who were locked down and shut down. Florida was not. So. You know, we've, we've had a couple of good years here of, of um, growth, unprecedented growth, actually. Um, so um, you know, we were fortunate um, um, there. You know, I can speak to that. We're, we're <laughs> part of that. We're, you know, <laughs> so we down do, during those times, right? We do, we do Florida and Maine now. Yeah, we do that. Um, how, what have you seen as you look at, let's, let's look at the last five years. Because how many, you've been there 12 years, 13 years? More? Up, up, uh, almost 30. Since 30. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I turned the numbers around. <laughs> 30. Wow. <laughs> that's that's interesting. Yeah. So how have you seen the demographics of the camper? Because, you know, we're we're up here in New England, so we get a different type of camper. We only get a six-month season. Right. But what have you seen in the changing demographics when we look at the RVs that are being sold, the van life experience, the boondocking experience right. speak to what your campgrounds are telling you about the makeup of campers in florida today sure but we are seeing that and i know that's that's the trend the younger camper and um you know the smaller campers and the van lifes etc um we do get that of course um, and the toy haulers uh that that's you know very prominent and many of the parks are seeing an increase in that but you know traditionally um with florida you have more of the the older demographic, um, you know, that, that makes up the majority of the audience. So we are seeing, you know, some new people enter the market, which is wonderful. Um, we welcome that and encourage that. Um, but if I'm to be honest, you know, the majority of it still makes, you know, 55 plus or the majority of our campers. Still, uh, okay. So, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Especially, you know, it, it changes. In the summer, we'll see the younger demographic. In the winter, which is our peak season for most of the state, at least obviously the central and south region, uh, it's your it's your typical snowbird market. So it's that clientele. 
That, that's that's mm-hmm. interesting. The yeah. uh, now down there, we we have a when we come back up to Maine in the summer, we have a park model in a park model resort up here. And I, I know noticed in the past in Florida, you had campgrounds and they had a lot of park models themselves. Sure. But has has there been an increase in development of park model only resorts as you know second homes and what have mm-hmm. you? That's what we're in up in Maine. It's, but they're very few and far between to try to find something like that in the northeast. Yeah, no, no, there, there definitely is. That's that's a big part of the big part of the market. Um, you know, I, I'd estimate probably 200, 250 of our parks, you know, park model side of their businesses is, is the primary side. You know, it's usually a mixed bag. You'll have park models and then you'll have the RV sites. Um, but you know, there are lots and lots of park models and yeah, we're continuing to see an increase in, in that area. Uh, so you have a little of both, um, but yeah, that's definitely a big part of the business in Florida for sure. So for people who may be watching, who are not familiar with your association or how they find information, uh, where, where should people go to find Florida reservations this year? Well, you can go to our website, uh, camp. Florida.com. Uh, that's our consumer facing website. And that lists all the RV parks, um, you know, throughout the state that are members of the association. So uh, it's a, a great resource to, to find the, the campground you want to go to and, you know, by location or wherever uh, amenities, et cetera, you can sort and find the park you want to visit and then uh, contact them, you know, either the website or phone, of course. Um, that's our, that's our outlet right there. So that's what I recommend. What I know you're big on snowbirds. Is is there such a thing as an average amount of time that people spend down there? Uh, the snowbirds themselves, do they come down for a month or two months? Or yeah, the typical oh, snowbird. Yeah, the typical snowbird season is probably about four months in November through into March, mid April. So you have um, the snow will start trickling in, like I said, mid November, December, January, February, March, and then you know pretty much through April. Uh, that that's the peak season right there and uh, that's for you know the southern parts uh, pretty much orlando south um so all the tampa and once again the fort myers area that, that that's the the peak section right there um that's where most of the snowbirds would typically uh, does it um south of orlando but we've seen a, a migration if you will up north so over the last few years we've had more and more snowbirds that haven't traveled as far south and they're making a Cala, central part of the state of Cala, Gainesville, and even a little farther north. Um, they're you know, using those parts where in the past you never saw that before snowbirds. So it's changing a little bit. I mean, yeah. This storm is probably going to change even more significantly. Yeah. You know, we look at it from afar, but I think in reading the trade publications and both about the outdoor hospitality and the RV industry, there's a lot of real estate money going into Florida with luxury resorts, uh, Margaritaville for one over in Auburndale, uh, Sun Resort, uh, Sun, Sun, yeah, I think Sun Resorts, but several of those have built large luxury. Is that, is that a trend? Are you seeing a lot more of them on terms of new construction or you're also seeing traditional mom and pop campgrounds expanding to meet the need? Both. I mean, we are having the, to the, the mom and pops that are adding sites. So yeah, we're seeing growth across the board, but as far as new properties that are being built, yeah, they're, they're typically your high end, more luxurious type of parks with all the amenities such as, you know, uh, Margaritaville, like you mentioned, um, that's a prime example of a you know beautiful park that was built that, um, you know, has everything anybody could want, um, you know, as well as all the, the glitz and glamour that go along with it. Um, so we're seeing, you know, lots of that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really difficult for a smaller park to come in and be built. Um, and the, it's, it's high dollar that we're talking about, obviously. Um, so usually it's, it's the big corporations that are coming in and, um, you know, doing the properties right. And that's, you know, there's a, a piece of the pie for everybody, if you will. And, you know, some, somebody, some, some campers want that, some don't. Uh, so we got a you know a large diversity of, of campgrounds here, um, but the newer ones being built, you know, are typically your nicer ones, and and they are they're filling up quickly too. So as soon as they're built, the sites are filled. It seems like. Yeah. 
So it's, it's safe, wow. safe to say that uh, there is something for everybody in Florida, whether it's a 40 or 50 mom and pop type operation in the woods, nice and quiet, or your equivalent of the Disney World of campgrounds as they keep getting bigger and better with uh, more amenities, but certainly something for everybody. And and I really appreciate you joining us today on the Camp Report Show and letting people know that Florida is open. Ninety eight percent of the campgrounds are open. Uh, we you know we thoughts and prayers for the people who are affected and impacted and and may have lost their business and everything else. But I appreciate you squeezing us into your very busy week, Bobby and. Uh, We'll get that message out also. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, Bob. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to say, um, you know, if there are any park owners out there that, that are listening and they're in Florida and they need help, you know, let us know. We've, we've um, drafted some important legislation over the past few years. And this is really important, Bob, that I kind of want to get out that yep. will allow park owners to rebuild based on their original permitting density um, and land use. So if a park was totally wiped away and they, they find out from local government that, no, we don't want the RV park here anymore. We have legislation in place that will hopefully provide protections to the RV park owner. We'll, we'll allow them to rebuild, not only rebuild, but to have the same number of sites they had prior uh, to this disaster. So uh, even even though zoning and what have you may have changed. May have changed that exactly. So if they were permitted 50 years ago for 500 sites, uh, they should be able to rebuild back to 500 sites. So. Uh, we have a, a very big law team and legal team that is working to help park owners. And um, anyway, we're here to provide yeah. assistance in any way that we can. Well, that, that's why you have associations like yours. So we, our guest this morning has been Bobby Conwell, president and CEO of the Florida RV Park and Campground Association. And Bobby, thank you again very much for joining us. And you, uh, we'll catch up to you down the road. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mike here from RV Blogger. Don't waste hundreds of dollars on an external GPS for your RV. All you need to do is download the RV Life app right onto your phone. This app is so cool. It has RV GPS built right into it. So you can load all the specific measurements and weights for your RV. It'll give you directions safe for your RV to follow. And by the way, if you have RV Trip Wizard, directions for your trips upload into this GPS automatically. Hey everybody, Winnebago is known for innovations and this product that we're going to talk about with Russ Garfin is no exception to the rule. It is the National Park Foundation Special Solus yep. and uh, Russ Garfin, you had a lot to do with putting this together. Tell us what you do at Winnebago so uh, that we know that you're the real deal. Okay, good, uh, good morning John. Yeah, uh, I'm the uh, Director of Product Management for our Class B and Class C uh, product development teams. Um, so we're responsible for all of our, our models built, uh, small vans and, and, uh, and the traditional uh, Class C's. This is our National Park Foundation Solus 59P. Uh, so it's on the non-extended uh, ProMaster chassis. Um, it's got a lot of nice new features that go along with the package. We kind of just dress it up a little bit and, and, and provide a little bit of uh, you know more rugged capabilities as well. You see we got the, the wheels and tires. Oh, okay. They're an upgrade. Big, uh, they have good rich tires that have the, the tread and everything and the nice black matte black finish uh, method wheels very uh, very nice design for and, and, a little bit for off-road use you bet you bet um, and then inside here we don't have it out here because of the show they've got it rolled up uh, for the customer that buys this but there is a full uh, it's it's not carpet it's uh, it's like this pontoon boat floor yeah 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 it's all yep. hemmed around the edge it fits inside makes it a little more padded provides a little insulation easy to clean that's part of the upgrade. Um, you'll notice, you know, you got a nice uh, refrigerator insert here. That's actually a kind of a, a graphical representation of, of yep. one of our national parks. Um, inside, we've got new window treatments or full blackout window treatments with little decorative elements on them. They're, each one's different. Some have pine uh, or palm trees, and others have mountain scenes. Um, but those are, are new for the for the National Park Foundation unit. Um, and then, you know, kind of the, the big. The big deal is around the back. There we go. Where we added the slide out drawer system. Look at that. So this is this is quite quite beefy and and uh, and that when slide out, I mean that that really goes away, Russell, yeah, when you uh, 
Yeah, and so, you know, you can put all your, your gear out here. This becomes like an outdoor kitchen. You obviously got your hot and cold water, your, your sink here. You can put your stove up on here. Um, it's really designed to be, you know, extremely um, durable. You can even, you know, you can even sit on this thing. Oh. It's, it's, it's well, <laughs> no, I would not attempt to do that. You can. You're light, lighter I would, than I am. I would not yeah. attempt so, to do I mean, it's just designed for, you know, rugged use. And I think people will really get a kick out of it. Um, uh, and when that's stored, when that's stowed, you don't even know it's there. No, it's. It, but if you need to get into it, you know, like say it's a rainy day and you've got some things stored away in here and you need to get at them, you still have the access. Oh, pop up those doors. You still have the access from Just the Just like that. Yep. And I think it's safe to say that people that buy this product and are parkers and outdoors people, they're not looking for luxury dining facilities. They're looking for... <laughs> they're looking uh, eat at the beach, right? Or eat, eat at the beach or the eat at the mountains or, or whatever, but... Yeah, um, yeah. We're talking know. about the, this product, the Solus, being surf to slope. It's designed to be surf used to slope. You know, in the mountains. It's all season. Uh, and it's also designed to be used at the beach. Um, you know, we've got some innovative things, like you've got an exterior shower on the, on the side and on the back, so both places. So if you need to wash, rinse the dog off or rinse your feet off, wherever it's convenient, you've got, you've got uh, water to do that. But, uh, again, all, all the systems are enclosed inside um, and, uh, and heated, so you can use this in even cold water yeah. or cold weather to go skiing. And national parks are hotter than hot. And I don't mean temperature-wise. Yeah, right I mean, there, yeah. you know... Um, and so this size can go everywhere. That's why yeah. they're so popular, right? Yeah, all the national parks and even, you know, in, in some of the trails that are limit the length of what motorhomes that you can, you know, if you're a glacier and so on, uh, this motorhome can go everywhere uh, that a van can go. I mean, you're not going to take a Horizon or an Adventurer into a national park and expect to find a parking space. Well, the good thing there is you're going to be pulling the, <laughs> something you can drive around in, right? So, right. Yeah, this, there's exactly. A, there's a... There's a Something for everybody. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to put you on the spot and yeah. ask you to step in there and show how easy it is to uh, convert this from daytime use to nighttime oh, use. Awesome. Okay. I think we've um, seen this before, but yeah, it's just nice. It's, so this allows you, if you want to use this for storage, like you want to throw bikes inside here or all your your camping gear, you can bring yeah. as much as you want. Um, and then of course just pop it down into bed. So this is a this is a um, European slat bed system full welded aluminum framework very lightweight but very comfortable it has some it has some strength. flexibility yeah. to it and then right all you gotta do is just pop this down and you see we even got these little side cushions here that yeah 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 extension. so you can yeah. use the full width of the van for sleeping and uh you know certainly somebody you know average height person can sleep very comfortably across here this is basically a full-size king bed or queen bed yep and um to open to close yeah, it back up, away, just pop it up boom yep pop it boom up. Up you go. And you hit the road, and it's got right. the snap right up there. That's it. And that's it. That's so, it. Russell Garfin, we want to thank you so much for uh, sharing the new National Park themed Solus. Yep. And, uh, oh, by the way, is this the Solus with um, upstairs sleeping? Um, yes. This has got a uh -huh. top top, so right back here. Okay. There's I almost there. forgot the most important feature. Oh, yeah. So, you can bring up the four, Solus. Four people. There's a ladder, you know, this is a big show, so sometimes we put the ladder yeah. away, the kids are right, right. getting a little Right, but I can still the uh, put the, at least put the yeah, take a look. camera up this there. This is also full queen-size sleeping with okay. uh, really nice ventilation on both sides in the front. Um, and you have, um, you know, three-point seat belts, which is a big part of this coach for the kids. If you bring the grandkids along, you know that they're going to drive safely here. And then they're gonna have a nice place to sleep up uh, out of the way. They're gonna kids just love pop it out there. There you go, and you've got yeah. uh, cooking facilities here. Was it two burners? Yep. Two burners, a sink, the fridge is yeah. right here. Yep. Really, everything you need to yeah, uh, it's fully fully functional. Lots hit the storage. road. Um, these both swivel. Both these seats swivel. Um, this table, you know, put it away. Put it there. Yep. You can take it right up, right? As yeah, well. You can take it off. Put it away if you don't like it at all. Oh, the cabinets have. Um, the magnets and, and uh, oh, oh the right there open so you don't bump your head access to the cabinets without bumping your head yeah. and more storage up over the yeah. driver's seat here, this is that pad oh there's the rug the, okay oh that's attractive floor. yeah that that matches the uh, upholstery yeah it matches the interior yep, very okay nice. russell always a pleasure having you here and uh want to wish you well thank you and um let everybody know that the solace national park edition yep is available at their Winnebago dealer. Sure. Yep. Thanks, John. Have a great day. Bye. -bye.